Hi everybody, this is Gardy Raymond for Consequence Video Designs. And today, we're gonna to take a step back from all the crazy stuff that I've been working on and touch on some of the basics. Now, when you're an editor or a motion graphics designer or in any kind of these roles, there are a few things that you're gonna get asked to create all the time. One of them is a lower third. And because this, is, this tutorial is geared towards uh, beginners, I'm going to be going over some basic things, so if you kind of already know this, then maybe jump ahead into a, into a different tutorial. But I'm going to try to go through and explain these things as quickly as possible, but also um, hopefully in a way that, that you can understand them. Now, if you don't get all this the first time through, don't worry about it. It's the kind of thing that you just need to be exposed to and, and start uh, learning and working on, on your own. And... By doing that, you're going to start to get the feel for After Effects um, and, and start kind of figuring out what you can do in the program and, and, and what options there are for you. So to jump right in and create a lower third, I'm going to show you one that I created for a recent project um, and show you how it's made. It's a little bit more advanced than just a basic, uh, putting a basic title on the screen, um, but because of that, we're going to see some other things that are going to get you moving towards your next goal, uh, your next project, and um, keep your skills moving forward. So here we go. Now you can see here what's happening is these, uh, this line's coming out, and a second line moves up vertically and reveals the text and this slightly opaque box behind the text that's, that helps separate the text from the background. So what we're gonna to touch on in this tutorial are three basic things. One is shape layers, and we use shape layers to create this opaque box and these lines here. Keyframes, which we need to animate these to make them move, and masks, which we need to reveal this text box and this text here. So let's jump right in and I'll show you how to create these. So what we're gonna do first is import this piece of footage that we need to create the lower third for. So I'm gonna import the raw footage of Nate's interview here and we'll just use that for the placeholder. Now, if you're working on the edit in Premiere, which you probably are first before you start creating graphics, I mean, that's the logical way to go you're gonna have your edit together in Premiere, and then you're gonna see what pieces of video you're gonna to use to create the lower third. The way that I prefer to do it is I do my rough edit or my, my pretty close to finish edit in Premiere, and then Premiere has the send to After Effects feature. So you can just select a piece of video and send it to After Effects, and that piece of video will go into After Effects. You can create your, your uh, graphics, whatever you need to do, save it, and then that will immediately be reflected and updated in Premiere. However, I'm just touching on the lower thirds in this one, so I'm not going to get into the round trip between Premiere and After Effects. Maybe we'll do that in a different one, or if you want to know right now, go ahead and, and search online, and there will be plenty of ways to show you the, the features that, that Adobe Creative Suite has for sending video from Premiere to After Effects and back. So, let's import the footage. We're going to go to Footage. It's in US Pro. Wednesday and we're gonna grab this piece of footage right here bring it in that's Nate I'm just gonna drop it right on the new comp icon so we'll have a new composition created for this entire interview and in this particular case it doesn't really matter what he's saying since we're just creating the graphic. Um, like I said, once you have an actual project edited, you'll know exactly which piece of footage you need to create the lower third on. But we're just using this piece of vid video for an example. So let's change this. So we're back at zero. So see how I drop this the footage in and it starts at frame 111,812. Let's just change this so it's back to zero. I'm going to hit Apple K. And it brings up the composition settings uh, dialog box. We can also go select the composition, composition, composition settings. And we can see here it has start frame of 111,812. You can just change that to one or zero, however you want, whatever you want. We're going to start it at one. 
hit OK. Now we can see the beginning here, we're at frame one. And you can see exactly how long it is once you get to the end, 3,576 frames. Okay, so let's just make it uh, 250 frames long at uh, 23 frames a second. Somebody can do the math for me and tell me exactly how long that is. But I'm gonna hit, uh, in the timeline, I just press the N key, N is in Nancy, to uh, set the work area end. I'm gonna right click in this work area, trim comp to work area. So now we just have these 248 frames here created. The first thing we're gonna do is create the shapes that we need. Now, one of the things you need to be aware of is whether or not your final video is gonna be for internet use or broadcast use. If it's in broadcast use, you need to worry about the title and action safe. So we click on this little icon here, grid and guide options, and title action safe. And it brings up these lines right here. It has 16 by nine title and action safe. And it also has four three, which are these lines in the middle. We're gonna worry about 16 by nine because pretty much everything we're doing these days is 16 by nine. And we need to worry about this inner rectangle here, the title safe, this inner one here. Uh, so we need to make sure that all of the text is inside this title safe area because we don't want it to get uh, chopped off during broadcast uh, by your TV screen's bezel or anything like that. If we're doing this just for internet use, um, which I actually did for this one, it doesn't matter quite as much, but you can see I've still created it. We're still inside title safe here. Uh, if it's just gonna be internet use, you don't really have to worry about this title action safe. You can slide it down and over a little bit and uh, give yourself a little bit more screen real estate here. So let's create our first shape layer, which is this green line here. So we're gonna go to our pen tool. Once we have the pen selected up here, we have this gray fill color and green stroke color. And you can see the stroke width is currently set at zero pixels. So we're gonna change that. Let's just change it to three pixels for right now. All you just do is click on it and type in three. Go ahead and hit return. And then having nothing else selected down here, you need to make sure nothing is selected. Uh, actions are different using the pen and the rectangle tools if you have a layer selected and if you don't. So to create shapes, you need to make sure nothing is selected, pen tool, and then let's click once outside of the screen so we make sure it starts off of the screen. Hold the shift key so you get a straight line and click one more time. And there's our line. Let's click back to the selection tool and click away from the shape layer. Now we can see we created one shape layer here. It's this green line. And already it looks like it's a little bit short, so I wanna make it a little bit longer. Let's press the Z key to get to the magnify tool. Click once to zoom in. Press and hold the space bar, turns to the hand, so we can click and drag around the screen to center it up a little bit better. Now let's select the shape layer. Let's go back to the pen tool. And see when we get over the shape here, the little carrot shows up instead of the pen. So we'll click on that and we can see our two points that we've drawn. So let's select our second point and click and drag it out. Now, if we don't hold shift, we can uh, move it wherever we want. Let's hold down the shift key so we keep it constrained to 90 degrees here, drag it out a little bit farther. All right, that looks like a good position for this and a good thickness, three pixels. If we wanted to make it thicker, we can just select it again Drag this out, thicker, thinner. Shape layers are really cool. Uh, once you start using them and figuring out what they can do, they can do a lot, they're really powerful. So we have one line. Now we need to make a second line as well as the background box, right? The semi-opaque box. So there's shape layer one, let's select it, press return so we can rename it and name it bottom line. All right. Let's duplicate the layer, so because we need a top line. So having it selected, let's hit Apple D, duplicates it, now it's bottom line two. Let's return, rename it, top line. So now we need to move the top line up into position where it needs to be. So let's select the top line. First of all, 
Let's go to our background layer and lock it just so we don't accidentally move it out of place, accidentally click on it, move it around. Let's go to the top line and let's press the P as in Paul key to reveal position. We have our X and Y coordinates. So we can just click and drag on our Y coordinate till we drag it up vertically to about how big we want it. And we'll be able to uh, move these around again if we need to, if it's not big enough or it's too big for our text. Uh, and sometimes it just jumps around. If you're using a, a, uh, a Mighty Mouse for your Mac, uh, sometimes if you accidentally brush it with your finger, you're gonna, it's gonna zoom in, zoom out. So if this happens during the recording, I apologize. It's not intentional. So now we have two lines and they're lined up perfectly because we just duplicated the bottom one and moved up the top one. So now we need the final opaque box behind it. So instead of the, the pen tool, which we could use to draw a rectangle, we can also select the rectangle tool. And if you click and hold on rectangle, you get the little flyout menu and you can select all these other options here too. But we're just gonna stick with the rectangle tool. We want hard corners. Again, nothing is selected down in the timeline. And let's press Z, zoom in one more time, reposition this so we can get a good look at it. Select the rectangle tool. We'll line up our center of our crosshairs here, with maybe the center of this line. Drag out and down. We can drag it off the screen until your blue line here is about in the center of the bottom line. So now we have a, if we solo this, we have a gray rectangle with a green outline. We don't want the green outline though, we just want the gray rectangle. Let's rename the shape layer just so we keep everything straight and we don't get confused. Name that rectangle. Now we can go up here, we can change our stroke width back to zero. And now we have just the rectangle, no stroke. Okay, let's unsolo that. Now we can see it's in front of the lines. We want it behind the lines. We want the lines to be the border. So let's drag it down, reposition it to, so it's behind the layers, behind the gray lines. And now it's 100% opaque. So we want it to be less opaque than that. Select the rectangle, press the T as in Thomas key on your keyboard, brings up opacity. Now all these things I'm using with the shortcuts on my keyboard are accessible other ways. If we just click on the triangle here, we can see uh, it'll show up contents, transform. Contents is the actual rectangle that's here and you can change stroke width, stroke, stroke color, uh, end caps, you can make dash lines, you can do all kinds of stuff with this, uh, with this shape layer, which is why I say they're so powerful. Uh, and then in transform is where you get, you can move uh, position scale, opacity, rotation. You can add all kinds of other things in here too. So you can see it's all those little shortcuts are available here, but I like the shortcuts. It makes you work a lot faster. So I'm going to press T again, brings back just opacity. And here we can either click on it and type in a value 20% or you can click and drag like we did earlier. Let's keep it at 20% and then we'll change it as needed. Okay, so there's our basic text box, right? Let's create text. So let's go up to the text tool, click on the text tool, and let's create a text box. So we'll click and drag, and create a text box inside here. And then we can just start typing. Nate Brown. We do name typically on the first line, and then on the second line we do position, or whatever other bit of information that we need to share about this person is. He is on Team Cannondale Garmin. So now I've typed it in, but my text box is too small. So we can't see it right now until I change uh, my font size. So I'm gonna hit enter. And let's change our font size, drag our font size down until it fits in there. So they both fit in there. Then I'm going to select Team Cannondale Garmin. I'm going to make this even smaller here because I want Nate to be bigger. Then we can also hit Apple A, select all the text. And we're going to change the letting options here back down. So there's 
Letting is the amount of space in between lines of text. So you can see as I drag this down, they get closer together, drag it up, it starts to, starts to fall out of the text box. Now real quick, if you don't create a text box, let's hide this real quick. If you don't create a text box and we just click in here with text, Nate Brown, Team Cannondale Garmin. It'll just type and you can type over the entire screen and then you can make your adjustments after that. Uh, it's really up to you however you want to do it. A lot of times I don't use text boxes. I just like typing text and then changing my settings. We actually going to want this left justified uh, because we're going to have it up against the left hand side here. Hit enter. Drag it over to the left hand side right here. And the other thing you want to think about too is think ahead in your project. If you're going to have to create more than one lower third might as well create this one properly and have it set up using, uh, you know, being left justified or right justified or centered, however you're going to want all of them to be, because typically all of your lower thirds are going to look the same throughout your project. So if you set this one up right and you create it properly, then for as many other people as you have, you can simply duplicate this sequence and just retype the text. And I can type my name and animator. There we go. And then we can adjust this how we need to adjust this. And you can create all these other new lower thirds a lot easier. So I'm going to undo this Apple Z, Apple Z, back to Nate Brown. Uh, we're going to adjust the letting a little bit more so it fits neatly in this box. Now I think that's a little bit too far away. I want this to be a little bit more compact, the whole text box. So let's bring those how we want them to look. I'm going to press V here so I have my selection tool active. I'm going to drag it down to the till I think it's a good distance away from the bottom. Then we're going to go back to the top line, adjust the position so it's back down where we want it to be. And then let's zoom in a little bit here. Drag this out. Now we need to scale this rectangle, now that we move the line, we need to scale this rectangle back down again so it fits properly behind this box. Uh, shape layers, you just need to pay attention to the anchor point if you're going to scale it down. To find the anchor point, let's zoom back out real quick because by default, no matter where you create the shape on the layer, your anchor point ends up right in the center of the screen. So if I select the rectangle, you can see this little anchor point icon is right in the center of the screen. To move this anchor point, you need to use the pan behind tool. It's this guy right here, or you can press Y on your keyboard. Press Y, brings up the pan behind tool, and now you can click and move the anchor point. The anchor point is the point on the layer where it will scale from, where it rotates from. So it's a very important thing. If you want your rectangle here to rotate, if we rotate it now, it's going to rotate around this point, and this end is going to come all the way up and rotate around. If we move it over here, it's going to rotate from the center point. Same thing with scale. We want it to scale from this bottom point, because this bottom point is in the proper position for our animation, but our top point isn't. So let's go back, uh, hit V again, selection tool. Now we can click on this top layer and drag it down to the top. Drag it down behind this line again. Now for an example real quick, if I put this anchor point in a different place, if I put this anchor point uh, way down here, it's going to scale from this point. So watch what happens if I start to scale this down. See where everything starts to move? Because it's scaling from that anchor point position. So undo. So if you're familiar with uh, Photoshop or, or Illustrator and how things would scale from, you know, pretty much the opposite point of wherever you clicked on, on the shape, it's not going to work exactly that way. So let's click on the anchor point, bring it back to where it needs to be, go back to the selection tool, V key, drag this back down to where it needs to be. Okay, Z, zoom back out. Uh, Command Shift A to deselect everything. And let's hide this. Now that we know this is in the right 
place. We don't need the title, uh, title action safe anymore, and it just kind of clutters up the screen. Let's hide that. So there we go. That looks pretty good, right? Now we got to do the animation, bring it on screen, bring it off screen. To animate things and make them move, you need to set keyframes. Keyframes are exactly as they sound. They are key specific frames in your animation that tell the program that something needs to happen at that particular point in time. Either something needs to start moving, something needs to stop moving, something needs to begin rotating, or the opacity needs to start changing or stop changing. Any of the properties that can be animated or changed are set by keyframes, basically. We're not going to get into expressions or any, any of the other really cool things that After Effects can do, but the basic principle of animation has to do with keyframes. And the keyframes are set with this little stopwatch icon right here. And if you see a stopwatch icon next to a property, that means you can animate it. So most things in After Effects can be animated, can be changed over time, which is fantastic. That's why this, that's the point of this program. See, we can animate anchor point, position, scale, rotation, opacity, open up contents. We can uh, change color over time. We can change stroke width over time. You know, we can, there's all kinds of things that we can change over time. Uh, and once we start applying effects to things, you can change those over time. You can link those properties to other properties to change over time. It's amazing how deep you can get into this. But the, again, the very basic is telling it where to start moving, telling it where to stop moving. And then in between those two keyframes, the program figures out all the different animation frames in between automatically. So this is set up how we want it to look in the, in the final position. But if we go back to this, the first thing that happens is this bottom line animates on. Right? So what we're going to do is make that bottom line animate on. And how long does it take here? Uh, let's do Apple K, change this to one, start at one. It takes, uh, it looks like what, 12 frames, 10 frames to animate on. So let's go ahead 10 frames. Go to our bottom line, position. Let's turn off the top line, turn off the rectangle, turn off the text here. And I'm gonna delete this second text that I had created. So we just have the position of the bottom line. Let's click keyframe. So now by doing that, now that it's blue, we have this little diamond here and we have this little diamond here. I'm gonna zoom into the timeline a little bit here. This means we set a keyframe at that point to tell the computer, tell the program, that at 10 frames, this is where this line needs to be. Now you can see nothing else happens yet because we haven't told the computer that it needs to go anywhere. And what I like to do a lot of times with my animations are work backwards. So we can see that at this, we set up the final, we set up this final look as to how we want it, this final lower third as to how we want it to look at the end. So since it's in that position, that's exactly where we want it to be. So I'm kind of starting at the end position where everything needs to be and working backwards from there. So let's turn these back off. Bottom line is set right here. So back to the beginning of the animation, let's go back to the beginning. And we want this to start off screen. So we can click and drag, this is our X value. Let's click and drag our X value until the whole line ends up off screen. So now, we told, this, told the program it needs to start, since we have a keyframe here, this shape needs to start over here, off the, off the screen, and then over 10 frames, animate in. So we hit zero for a preview. Boop. We can see it just animates in on screen. Now what's the next thing that happens? The text and the top line reveal as does this opaque box. How long does that take? And now it, I, I'm just building this to be uh, the same as this previous one. This figuring out the timing is just gonna be to your taste. Maybe you're gonna want it slower, maybe you're gonna want it faster. You're gonna have to have to tweak with your own personal 
uh, your own personal animation that you're making. Um, but for this one, I'm just kind of taking a look to see how long it takes. So up to the top from frame 10 to frame 18. So we're looking at frame 18. This is up at the top. So let's go down to frame 18. And since we already set this up, it's already here. So we don't need to move anything for right now. We can just go to frame 18 where this where this top line ends up in its final position. Hit P, set a keyframe. So now it's just the bottom line that animates in, and then the top line is going to animate up. So the top line doesn't start animating up until the bottom line sets into place on screen. So let's go back and put the timeline indicator at 10 frames where the bottom line stop moving and animate the vertical position, the Y position here. And bring it back down. Let's bring it back down until it matches the Y position of the bottom line. So we can just type in 540 and they're going to be equal uh, in the same place right there. Now something you may have noticed, I didn't have to click the stopwatch again to create this second keyframe. Let's undo Command Z, Command Z. Once you have a keyframe set, once this stopwatch is blue on any layer, on any property, once the stopwatch is blue, all you need to do is change the value of that layer, whether it's changing the color, changing the position, changing the opacity, whatever it is. All you have to do is then change that, and it automatically creates a new keyframe. So again, let's go back, type in 540, so it's at the same place as this line. Now we can't see the animation of the first line because the second line just lives there. So what we can do is select the beginning of this layer right here on the edge when, it cha when the cursor changes from your selection tool to this little left right arrow and drag it out, drag it back until it lines up with your uh, your keyframe, your timeline indicator. And in this particular case, it's easy, but if we had it, say we had it zoomed all the way out and it's really small and we wanna, we're want to, we not sure where it needs to be, if you click and start dragging and then press shift and hold shift, it will lock to your timeline indicator. So if your timeline indicator is on your keyframe and you can tell it's on your keyframe because this is blue, if we move this off the keyframe, see, there's no blue there. It, it, it's saying that there's no keyframe at that particular time. So once we move it back onto that keyframe, we can see it's blue here, we're on a keyframe, and then we can move this layer, drag the end point of this layer to this point. Something else to be careful of, make sure you don't click on the layer. If you click on the layer and drag it, it moves the whole layer, keyframes included. So we don't wanna do that. We just want to drag the end point, out point, to right there. So now, let's go back to the beginning. So we're going to click on this right here. See these, um, as this is selected, see how there's a blue line here? When you select this, it's just the outline of the layer uh, to give you an idea where it is. So when it moves off, sc off screen, this bottom line, for example, when it moves off screen, you can still see it off screen. Uh, but sometimes those lines get in the way of your animation, what you actually want to see. So to get rid of those, you can click on this toggle mask and shape path visibility, and it gets rid of that line right there. You can also hit command shift H. We'll hide, uh, we'll hide and show those. Actually, they do slightly different things. This hides the mask and shape path, but does not hide this motion path of uh, your anchor point here. So if you command shift H that actually hides and shows everything rather than just the mask shape. So I like command shift H. It's something I use all the time. So now we have one line animates out. The second line animates up. Now we're going to get into masks. Not difficult at all and a very basic part of After Effects that you need to know to learn how to do. So in this example, we can see as the line goes up, let's hide this. As the line goes up and it also reveals the text and it reveals the gray box behind it. 
So to get that, we need to add a mask to the layer. Masks are typically added to a layer one of two ways. You can either have a layer selected, so I have my video layer selected here, and go to the pen or the rectangle tool. This is why earlier I said when you created these shapes, you wanted nothing selected. Because if a layer is selected and you select this rectangle shape and start drawing, it creates a mask. You can move the mask around and this is how you show and hide different parts of your image. Let's click on this mask and delete it. That's one way to add a mask. The thing about shape layers is these also double as shape tools. So if we have a shape layer selected and we click on this rectangle and we draw it, it draws another shape on this shape layer rather than a mask. We can see in the contents, let's turn this off. The first rectangle we drew was rectangle one. Toggle it on and off there. Now, since I, I had this selected and I tried to draw a mask on here, since it's a shape layer, it drew a second shape. You can have multiple shapes in a single shape layer. So when I turn this on, we see we have the second one rather than a mask drawn. So let's delete that rectangle. So on shape layers, what you want to do is right click on the shape, go to mask, new mask. And it creates a mask, the exact same shape as that layer, which is fine. In this particular case, that's what we want. So let's zoom in here again. Hold, uh, pressing and holding the space bar and clicking and dragging to uh, use the hand here. Zoom back out. Thank you, Mighty Mouse. Now that we have a mask on this layer, select the rectangle and you can either toggle, uh, toggle these down and you get to masks or you can press M as in Michael and it will bring up all the masks on your layer. Since we only have one mask, only one mask shows up. Now we have this selected and it's a yellow mask. Say I don't like yellow, I want something that stands out better. Actually yellow works pretty good in this case, but say you have a, a sun behind this or yellow flowers and you want to see something better. You just click on this little color square right here and the color picker comes up and you can change it to whatever color mask you want. If you've seen any of my, my tutorials before, you know I like bright pink. It's usually pretty good. So we have a bright pink mask here set up. And you can see since we set up our, our rectangle to be behind these lines, we can see the mask lines up perfectly with the edges of that rectangle. And what we wanna do is animate that mask to follow the movement of this top line as it reveals. We want it to reveal that line. So again, working backwards, this rectangle is in the final place we want it to be. This mask is in the final place we want it to be. So at the end, we click once on the mask path keyframe, set a keyframe, go back to the beginning where this first starts to move, get our selection tool, double click on the mask to select the whole mask, and then we can just drag it down. And let's drag it down so it's behind behind that original line there, hit the enter key. Now we have, you can see we have a first keyframe set here to a second keyframe. And as we scrub through, you can see, I'm gonna use the page up and page down keys on my keyboard. This is gonna go one frame at a time. So as I go frame by frame, you can see that the line of this mask is matching up evenly with the motion of this top line here. So there we go. The way I had the mask drawn, it looks like we can't see anything on this since the mask is, I'm gonna Command Shift H, hide that. Command Shift H also hides masks. So we can see now that I hit Command Shift H again, we have the mask and the shape layer outline. So because the mask looks like it's a straight line here, it looks like you can't see anything, but you never know. You might have left a pixel or two in there uh, between the edges of the mask, which back in the beginning, we might be able to see. In this particular case, I can't see it, but sometimes you might. So just like this top line shape layer, let's drag the endpoint of the rectangle layer back to 
the beginning here. So it doesn't, this layer won't even exist until it needs to start existing. So we don't have to worry about stray things showing up here. That shows up. There we go. Now we just need to do the same thing with the text. Let's turn the text on. And unfortunately, solely in After Effects without any plugins, we can't just copy this mask. Command C, whoops, I'll do. Um, Command C, copy the mask, select the text, Command V, paste the text, uh, paste the mask on the text. I don't know where it is. Where's my mask? Mask here, uh, Command Shift H. It ends up way down, look, it, it ended up way down here because of, and it's kind of off, and even if we drag this out to where it needs to be, it's in the wrong place. So you need to create a new mask solely for this layer. Now there's a really cool plugin that you can get from aescripts.com. We'll do a quick little aside here. Let me uh, go over to Safari. Copy mask to layer. 10 bucks, totally worth it. And what it does is it allows you to copy this, copy this mask, since it's right here in the, in the picture, and paste it to any other layer, copy any mask from a layer and paste it to another layer, and it retains the same pixel location on your screen as it did on this layer. In this case, this mask is right here on the screen, and because of the position of the, of the shape layer and the animation that we've done to it compared to the position of the text layer, when we copy and paste, just copy and paste the mask, we end up with it in the wrong place. But with this little plug-in here, copy mask to layer, it will actually take this mask, copy this exact animation, and paste it in this exact same place for whatever other layer you want. It works great for rotoscoping if you need to rotoscope a lot of things. Um, and it works great in situations like this where you have some kind of mask animation that you need to duplicate many times. Uh, and it's just a really big time saver for 10 bucks worth every penny, can't recommend it highly enough. However, this is a simple uh, simple thing that we're doing and I don't wanna really get into plugs, so that was just a little aside. So let's just recreate this mask how we need to create uh, recreate it. So we'll delete that mask on this layer. We're gonna go back to the end position of these two locations here. Let's zoom in a little bit here again, so we're a little closer. Take the text layer and a text layer uh, unlike a shape layer, you can just draw your text or your mask on. If you want to right click mask, new mask, you can do that. Or you can draw it on a text layer like you can with a regular layer. So I'm going to start in the middle of this line here. And you can see as you draw it out where it's going to be. Masks default to add. So that means where you put the mask is what you're going to see. And what's outside the mask is, is what you're not going to see. So we're gonna hit M, mask path. You can see mask is set to add. If you wanna change it, change it so it's the inverse and hide just what's behind the mask, you can change it to subtract. Um, and there's many other things you can do here too. Add is the default. That's what we're gonna go for right now. So we can set our keyframe for mask path right here, right where the other ones are. Let's go back to the beginning, just like we did with the, with the rectangle. We're gonna double click it. Drag this back down here. We have the second keyframe set automatically. And now as we reveal, we can see it reveals along with the line. However, what we're seeing here is because this text is on top above the line layer here, we can see some of the text is bleeding onto as we go frame by frame some of the text is bleeding onto this top line. So to fix that, rather than tweaking with the mask a little bit, let's just drag this down below the top line layer so then we're not gonna see it. So now it still looks like it's being revealed by that top layer. And there we have our basic animation. Let's hit N as in Nancy. Set our out point here and then uh, let's zoom out and hit the zero key for a quick little RAM preview. 
So there we go. We, it animates right on. From here, we could either have a, uh, do a straight cut. If it's, um, if it's only going to be on screen for a, a short while, we can just leave it on screen until uh, the next shot comes up. We could fade it out. Um, but I want it to animate back out the way it animated in. So let's uh, let this play through. Seems like that's about a good time, maybe three seconds, three or four, 24 frames a second. 60, 72, so uh, 72 is, but 72 plus or 18, 80, so 90, 90 frames. So we'll want it on, on, uh, on screen for three seconds after it animates on. So we'll go up to 90 frames. I think that's about right. My math is not good. So uh, if I'm ever wrong on these kind of things, you let me know. Uh, first, even though we don't need to because the mask totally hides it, let's drag the beginning of the text to the beginning here too. Also, if you hold down shift, it will snap to keyframes as well, not just the playhead. So I hold down shift and it snaps right to that keyframe as well. So working backwards from uh, the way it came in, we're gonna have everything disappear and then uh, uh, you know, go back down and then slide back out to the right. So what we can do, number one, we could set a second keyframe here for the, uh, we want, well, the top line, Nate Brown and the rectangle are all going at the same time. So let's just work from the top down. So back to keyframes. We've had it start, we had the motion start here and stop here. And then we want that motion to stay the same for this three seconds and then start again. So because we want it to stay the same before it starts again, we need to set a second keyframe. So we click on this little rectangle here, rectangle, this little diamond here to create another keyframe that's exactly the same as the current keyframe that's here. So what this is telling the program again is motion started here, stopped here, stays the same all the way through here, and then it's gonna go back down to where it needs to be. So we could either type in 540, so the line goes back down to where it needs to be, or another option is we can select this first keyframe, command copy, and then command paste. So this duplicates this keyframe and pastes it here. So again, we're getting the same effect here. And if you're wondering about this video uh, brightness here, it's just because this is the beginning of the clip and I was adjusting my exposure. So sorry about that if that's distracting. Anyway, so that's the second thing we can do to animate that back down. Third thing we can do, which is actually pretty neat, especially if you have a lot of keyframes and a lot of things to do, we can select both of these keyframes. We're gonna mark, click and marquee drag. So both of them are selected. Now I'm back down in the Nate Brown layer since we already created the animation for the top line. Nate Brown, we're animating the mask back down. So I selected both of those. Command C, copy, and then Command V, paste. So what this did is you can see it animated on and then goes back down to where it was and then animates back on because it just pasted these two keyframes right here again. So it's got all, it, it got all wacky. But now that these are pasted and these are selected, we can right click on them, go to keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes. So that flips the order of these keyframes. So basically it's taken these keyframes, put them here, but flip their position. So I'll put this keyframe, the second keyframe here first, and this first keyframe here second. And this will work if you have a ton, if you have 20 keyframes in here, select them all, paste them, time reverse keyframes, it's just gonna go backwards if you wanted something to flicker in and out or you know something like that. So you can see I arbitrarily chose this point here for this one, but we can see that this is how long they are or how long we want this animation to be. So let's go to this keyframe here and take this one up here and line it back up so we're back at the same time. Now all we have left is the rectangle to animate. So let's mark, click, marquee drag, command C, command V, right click, keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes. So now we can see this entire animation goes back down 
where it needed to be. And then once we get to here, we want this bottom line to animate out, right? Command C, Command V, keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes. Now it slides out. Now we still have all these other layers existing here in this time. So if I command shift H here, hide everything. You can see while the text in the box disappears, this other line is still here. And technically these other layers, the text layer and the rectangle layer still exist as well. So we can do what we did before, go to the end of the composition, click and drag this all the way back down to this position and then it will disappear where it needs to disappear. Or another option, which I end up using a lot too, is selecting the text and the rectangle. And I can Command Shift D, which splits the layers and creates two versions of the layer. And then I can just select the second half of both layers that I don't need and delete them. So there's our basic animation. One other final little thing we can do if we, if we want to snazz it up a little bit more, let's select all of the layers. Let's close them up to keep it clean. Now let's select all of, these, all of these lower third layers and click on this box right here. This is Enable Motion Blur. Now, you're not going to get motion blur right away. You also need to enable motion blur in the composition, which is this button right here. Now watch what happens to this line when I click this. See, you get this little bit of motion blur in here as it, as it animates out. And then as this line animates up, you can see a little bit of motion blur in that one too. Anything with motion. So if I turn this off, you can see it's just straight. Now it has that little bit of motion blur in it. Now this is totally up to you. Sometimes it looks a lot cleaner if you don't have motion blur. Um, just letting you know this is another option out here. Okay, I hope this was a good introduction to some keyframes, some basic masking, and a basic lower third um, to help you try to move, continue to move your skills forward in After Effects. Like I said, this is gonna be something that you're asked to create all the time, uh, pretty much no matter what the project is, you're gonna have to create a lower third. And those templates get old really quick. So having a little bit of knowledge about shape layers and animation and masks is going to let you create some of these more custom layers for whatever project it is that you're working on. This project file is online at consequencevideodesigns.com, so feel free to download it, uh, start playing with it, check out how things work, um, and, and hopefully that helps you a little bit. So until next time, thanks for watching. Again, I'm Gardner Raymond, consequencevideodesigns.com. Talk to you soon. Bye.